moment. Only in that relationship with our Heavenly Father do we find everything that satisfies us, and so He is our great priority. Welcome to Corinth Baptist Church Sunday Worship Services with Pastor Teacher Joey Carroll. When pastors fall into sin, they gouge out the road of the gospel. If you're born again, and yet you are unrepentant in sin and unwilling to deal with sin in your life, you're gouging out the road to advance the gospel. I've already assumed something. Uh, I already assumed that you understood what the gospel is, and I know that the majority of you have been coming to church or going to church your entire lives, but I never want to assume anything. I did with the, the firefighters this morning, and when I talk about the gospel, obviously I'm talking about the power of God unto salvation for everybody who believes. What that means is it's the message of God's love. It's the message of God's grace. The gospel is God's message that He sent His Son, who was born of a virgin Mary, who lived an absolutely sinless life, and then absolutely willingly died on the cross, and God's wrath, God's anger, God's judgment was poured out on Him in our place. And the gospel says that if we put our trust in who Jesus is as the Son of God in His finished work on Calvary, then we are made right with God. We are no longer sinners in the eyes of God. Now we are saints. We are the children of God. That's a good message. Because every man born will stand before God and be held accountable for his life. And every man will stand before God and will be seen as a sinner and be judged and be condemned and will be under the wrath of God. Unless, of course, he has come to understand the grace of God in the gospel and he's received the Lord Jesus Christ. So when I talk about the gospel, I'm talking about that message, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we also have the Gospels that are in our Bibles. We have four of those, the first books of the New Testament. But before we get to those four books, let me describe for you where you're sitting at right now in your Bible. You have just walked through, or we've just laid to the left-hand side, the first 39 books of the Bible that we call the Old Testament. If you were to sit down and read from Genesis all the way to Malachi, you would come away with three points of understanding. The first point that you'd come away from is God is faithful. Unquestioning, from Genesis to Malachi, we have a very faithful God. That is something you would, without question, understand. If you sat down and read those 39 books, you'd come away with the second thought. Man is utterly sinful. Man is rebellious and man is sinful and man wants to be his own God. And that's clear to see as well in the Old Testament. The third point that you'd come away with if you read those 39 books is God has promised to send a Savior for man's sins. And He makes that promise time and time and time again in those 39 books. And then you turn the page, you walk into the New Testament, and God fulfills His promise. God sends a Savior. And it's so important for you to understand this that He puts four books, the first four books in the New Testament, to tell you the story about how God fulfilled His promise to send a Savior to save mankind from His sins. Four books written by four different men that give us four unique perspectives, okay? The first three of those, and I made the firefighter say that this morning, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the synoptic Gospels, meaning they're similar or they're the same. They use the same stories, the same analogies, the same parables. Luke's a little bit unique in that. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. But John's just simply known as the fourth or the fourth Gospel. There's no other Gospel like his. John's extraordinary. John's, John's a lot of theology, a lot of spiritual things in John. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke, nonetheless, they're so similar, they're so same are they so similar that they're known as the synoptic Gospels. Now, again, God wanted you to understand the story, so He told it four times. Once you get out of the story of God fulfilling the promise, you immediately walk into the book of Acts, and you see the effects of what God has done in fulfilling His promise. 
The Spirit comes and lives in the hearts of the believers. The church is born and things begin to radically change in the children of God. In the book of Acts, we see the effects. You walk out of the book of Acts and you walk into what is known as the epistles and now you begin to see how we're to live now in light of being called the children of God. That's your Bible. The promise is made. The promise is fulfilled. The effects of the promise fulfilled is seen. And then the commands and the calls to you now live differently as the children of God. And that sums up your entire Bible. Now who is Luke? Go with me to the Gospel of Luke, the very first page. And I want to talk about the person Luke. Because he's absolutely extraordinary to me the more I've studied this and thought about him. When we think about Luke... He is known as, if we get to heaven we find out differently, I was wrong, but he's known as the only non-Jewish writer in that book in your lap. Every single other book in that book or every single letter in that book was written by a Jew or Hebrew, save two, Luke and Acts. And actually, Luke and Acts is one book, and when we went through Acts, I showed you that. If you'll read the first two verses, you'll think... Luke never stopped writing. That's exactly right. He never stopped writing. And it's unfortunate that they're separated that way in our Bible. But he begins the story in Luke and he continues the story in Acts. So as a writer, he really gives us the most content that we have. And it's really cool because he's just like us. He's not a Jew. He's a Gentile. So we're really going to appreciate his perspective. In Colossians 4, again, with thinking about who is Luke, Colossians 4, Paul refers to him as the beloved physician. He was a doctor. Before he came to faith, he was a practicing physician, probably somewhere near Philippi. He hears the gospel. He's completely swept away by the love of God and the truth of the gospel. And it radically reorients everything about his life. Everything changes. When you get to Philemon, Paul refers to him as a fellow worker in reference to the gospel ministry. He's not just a doctor anymore. Now he's a missionary. Now he's an evangelist. Things have changed in his life. When you get to Paul's last letter in 2 Timothy 4, Paul is running through just a few people that have left him, that have deserted him. And this is what Paul says while he's in prison writing his last letter. He says, only Luke is still with me. What a guy. I mean, he went from running his own practice to now he's in prison with the Apostle Paul just to minister to his needs. And he says, only Luke's still here. Now I'm starting to really like this guy. This guy's something right here. And if you remember when we walked through the book of Acts, Paul kind of, I mean, not Paul, Luke kind of gives us a clue that he's in on particular mission trips because he begins to speak from the first person. It's called the we sections in Acts. W-E, the we, meaning... I'm writing and I'm here. The first we section was in Acts 16, and we see Luke on Paul's second missionary journey, meaning he probably just came to faith recently, and he walked away from his practice, and he became a missionary. You see the we's in Acts 20 and 21, and that's on Paul's third missionary journey. You see him in Acts 27 through 28. Paul's on a boat bound for Rome where he's going to be tried and arrested and imprisoned and they have a shipwreck on the island of Malta and Luke says, and we shipwrecked. He's in the shipwreck. So you meet Jesus as a physician and a few years later you find yourself floating in an ocean in a horrible storm thinking you're probably going to die. But if you don't, as soon as we get to land, what are we going to do? We're going to preach the gospel. I'm thinking I really like this guy. But this guy really messes up my theology and my life because this guy, when he met Jesus, every part of his life changed. He didn't stop being who he was. He kept practicing because he was probably Paul's personal physician. But he kept taking care of people. Do you realize, I think it was on the... Probably the third missionary journey that we see in Acts 20. When Eutychus fell out of the window because Paul preached too long, could happen this morning, he fell out and they picked him up and said he's dead. Do you realize Dr. Luke probably ran down there, picked the boy up and looked at Paul and said he's, he's dead. It's probably Luke. 
And Paul goes, no, nah, it's fine. Just lay him back down. And he lays out across from him, begins to pray, and raises the boy back from the dead. Probably Luke got to do that. Everything about this guy's life changed. And here's my overwhelming thought as I just began to think and meditate on this guy. The Western gospel, the American gospel, I'm not seeing anything change. You see, I think the problem is this guy was converted by the Holy Spirit. And I think when the Holy Spirit does the conversion, people's life radically changes. And I think when men convert other men, nothing changes. I think when men press people into making a decision for Jesus, they might actually decide for Christ, but they haven't been converted by the Spirit of God. I'm telling you, Luke's going to challenge us to the very core of who we are. He lays out some stuff in this gospel that just blows my mind about what it means to actually be a follower of Christ. And I'm like, you better believe Luke would say, any man come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. You better believe Luke would include that because that's exactly what Luke did. You better believe it's going to be found in here when a man comes up to Christ and says, I want to follow you, but first let me go bury my father. And Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. You follow me. Of course Luke would put that in there. He knew what that meant. It was life for him. We're really going to be challenged by understanding Luke as an individual as he begins to write this account because the, the gospel changed him. The gospel changed his life. And you're going to be left with the question, has the gospel changed my life? Was I converted by a man or have I been converted by the grace of God? Because that's what happens to us. When we get to chapter 1 in Luke, verses 1 through 4, we pick up on a few other things. So let me read this to you, and I'll make a few other points here, and then I want to just walk through the entire book. But Luke says, "...inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative or a story." He's going to write us a story of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the Word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, yes, he did, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things which you have been taught. Now, in itself, this first four verses tells us a great deal about Luke as well. The first word is translated in as much. You're not going to find it anywhere else in your Bible. In fact, Luke's going to introduce us to 80 words that are not found anywhere else in your Bible. Meaning Luke's vocabulary was on a very different level for the time. He was an extremely intelligent person. In fact, when you read ancient historians, he starts out his account just like all the other ancient historians did, using the same word, same grammar, same constructions. This dude's smart. And I was left with the idea how many people that are really intelligent love Jesus so much that he has radically reoriented their life. Not many. Not many that I know. This guy's very intelligent. And he says that it seemed good to me, having followed all things closely, to write an orderly account for you. Not only is he a physician, not only is he an evangelist and a missionary, he's an historian. Luke is known as one of the greatest first century historians that we have. He's excellent at recording history. And most of the stuff that he writes in here, no one else records in the other Gospels. He's very particular and very careful about being an, a historian. Last thing about this that we pick up is, I'm writing an orderly account for you, verse 3, most excellent Theophilus. Let me add something else or another hat to for Luke's head. He's a pastor. He's caring about one individual that they would really be grounded in their faith. And he thought so much of this young individual or this young man in my mind that he sat down and he carefully wrote out an orderly sequence of the events of the life of Christ. So Luke is quite 
the person, an amazing person that was, again, extraordinarily converted by the gospel. Now, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 1 if you haven't already. And I'll explain the homework on the back of your kid's sheet as we begin to walk through this. Once you get past the introduction that we're about to walk through here in just a few moments, you get through the first verse through verse 4, and you'll notice the subheading. And again, ESV, we're all the same. And it has the birth of John the Baptist foretold. And if you'll look uh, on verse 26, just above that, you'll have the subheading, the birth of Jesus foretold. Now, we'll get there in the weeks to follow. This is what I'd like for you to do with your kids this week. I'd like for you to encourage them to go read the birth account of John about 10 times and make as many observations as they possibly can. Read the birth of Jesus 10, 12 times. Make as many observations about the birth of Jesus that they can. And then compare and contrast the differences because that's what I'm going to preach on next week. Luke is so crazy careful with everything that he's doing. He runs everything parallel with this. You've got the birth of Jesus or the birth of John followed by the birth of Jesus. And then that culminates with Mary and Elizabeth meeting together and then Mary singing the Magnificat. Keep turning the page. You'll find the actual birth of John the Baptist and then Zechariah sings a song called his prophecy and we'll compare Mary's song with Zechariah's song. And that's immediately followed up by the birth of Jesus. So you've got the birth of John, the birth of Jesus. He keeps doing this with John and Jesus so we'll understand. Obviously the birth account of Jesus is very long. There's a reason for that. Then you'll get to, in the next, still in chapter 2, you get Jesus presented at the temple. And John doesn't get a subtitle for that, but you see J John presented at the temple. You see the subtitle, The Boy Jesus in the Temple. You've also seen John in the temple. You didn't get a subtitle for that, though. Chapter 3, you see John the Baptist prepares the way. That's John's ministry. And then you turn to chapter 4, and Jesus' ministry begins in verse 14. Everything's running parallel because he wants you to make the comparison between John and Jesus. Because if you, if you understand what John's doing, you're going to understand who Jesus is. And so he's very careful to put these two side by side. And I'm going to show you how to walk your kids side by side and study the Bible as they do that. But it's going to be a challenge for, for most of us in here because our kids are probably going to do a better job than we are. But I want you to do this with your kids, okay? I want you to sit down and walk them through this. So once you get past the birth narrative, you see in, John, or in Luke 4, 14, Jesus' ministry begins, and it's in the power of the Spirit of Galilee. So you have the Galilean mission. And it runs all the way through chapter 9, but don't turn there yet because I want to tell you what you're going to see from 4 to 9. You're going to see everything that Jesus is doing. All the miracles... All the amazing things that he does, you see in the first part of this gospel account. The doings of Jesus, if you will. If you'll look in, you're still in Luke 4, you'll see Jesus heals a man with an unclean demon. Then the next subtitle, you'll see Jesus heals many. If you'll start turning your Bible over to Luke 6. You see a rare moment in the first half of Luke where there's actually teaching but it teaches us something else about Luke. Look in verse 20 of chapter 6. It's the Beatitudes in Luke 6, 20. It says, Jesus lifted up, on, lifted up His eyes on His disciples and He said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. What did He leave out? What did Matthew say? Anybody remember? Poor in spirit. Why did Luke leave out poor in spirit? You want me to tell you why? Because he's passionate about the poor. The gospel has changed his perspective about humanity. And now all of a sudden he's passionate about poor people, about suffering people, and about sick people. That's what the gospel does in your life. And it's probably more commonplace for a physician. But he's so comfortable with saying, blessed are the poor, I'm done here. Because he's so passionate about poor folks. And he's so passionate about suffering. And he's so passionate about the sick. 
It's part of what the gospel does for us. And I think it's fascinating that we find ourselves in the midst of a guy who loves the marginalized and the ostracized from society because the SBC right now is fighting over social justice and we just jumped right in the gospel that has more social justice issues than any other book in your Bible. Keep turning your page there. You'll see in chapter 8, the subtitle of that, Women accompanying Jesus. You see more women in the Gospel of Luke than you do in other any other book in your Bible. You know why that is? Because they're marginalized and ostracized in first century. And Luke loves people like that. In fact, if you look at verse 3 of that, he says, And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, Susanna, and notice, and many others in reference to women, who provided for the disciples out of their own means. So the women were working, funding the ministry of Christ. And I think that's absolutely fascinating because the SBC is embroiled right now over the role of women. They're about to split over this issue and we're walking into the gospel that deals with women more than anyone else does. But that's Luke. If you'll notice, continued miracles in the same book. Jesus calms a storm. Jesus heals a man with a demon. Jesus heals a woman and Jairus, his daughter. If you keep turning, you come to chapter 9. Turn over to 950 and 951. If you're a pencil marker or a circler, circle 951. Because this is where Luke changes everything. When the days drew near, 951, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Everything in the book changes at this point because Jesus has committed his way to Jerusalem. And you're not going to see miracles and all these magnificent, powerful things happening. Now you know what you're going to see? Teaching and preaching because he's preparing his people for what's about to happen to him. And so you're going to see parable after parable after parable after parable. Him teaching everything. Chapter 11, he teaches us how to pray. Keep turning. Chapter 12, you see the parable of the rich fool. Chapter 12, verse 13. In fact, Luke put 19 more parables in his gospel than any other gospel writer. They're, they're not found anywhere else. Because he's enamored with the teaching and the wisdom that Jesus displayed while he was here. Keep turning your pages. You come to uh, Luke chapter 16. You have the parable about the rich man and Lazarus. Remember Lazarus covered with sores and desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Let me tell you who gets a hard time in Luke's gospel. The wealthy... And the religious elite, he has little tolerance and patience for people who are wealthy and for people who are religious and proud of it. In fact, if you turn over to chapter 19, you'll see the story about Jesus and Zacchaeus. And I find that interesting because he puts Jesus and Zacchaeus right after chapter 18 where he talks about the rich young ruler that denies Christ. So Luke tells the account of what rich people's problem is. They trust in their riches. And then he backs it up with a rich man who actually comes to faith in Christ. And what does Zacchaeus do with his money? (laughs) He gives it away. He's just like, here, I met Jesus. I don't need this anymore. So Luke, again, he's very powerful in his viewpoints and in his teaching. Uh, Chapter 19, verse 10 It sums up Luke's theology. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Chapter 19, verse 45, circle that. Everything changes there because he actually walks into Jerusalem. And it says there, Jesus cleanses the temple. He entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying, it is written, my house should be a house of prayer. So the very first thing he does when he walks into Jerusalem is to clean the temple. What follows in the chapters ahead is the Passion Week, His death, His burial, His resurrection. And then I want you to notice with me, turn to me to chapter 4, 24, I'm sorry, chapter 24, 
And let's look at how Luke closes things out. After his resurrection, Luke 24, verse 44. Luke records the words of Jesus. And he said, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then Jesus opened their minds to understand the Scriptures, and He said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer, and on the third day rise from the dead. And notice verse 47, And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all the nations, beginning with Jerusalem. Guess who talks about repentance more than any other writer in the New Testament? Luke. He's going to hammer repentance. In fact, I'm of the opinion after studying this so much, when I get through preaching through Luke, you're going to think you've never met Jesus. Because when he lays out repentance, he really means repentance. Look at verse 53, the very last, or 52 and 53. They worshipped him, Jesus, and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. So when Jesus walks into Jerusalem, we first see Him in the temple cleaning it out. And when Jesus dies, is buried and raised from the dead, and ascends on high, Luke leaves us back in the temple. Except this time the temple is not being cleaned out. This time they're worshiping their new Savior, their King, their Lord in the temple. And it's a beautiful picture of what has been accomplished by the glory and the grace of God. So now, that's how you run through the book. But let's go back to chapter 1, verse 1, and look at just a few things this morning. And I'll preach now, and we'll be finished. I'm going to make you turn back to Luke 24. I can already tell you in just a second, so if you want to do that. But anyway, Luke 1, verse 1. Let me read it to you again. This is Luke's introduction to the story about Jesus. He says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely from some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things which you have been taught. That phrase here, I won't underline it, you can see it well enough, a narrative of the things that have been accomplished. It's in a perfect passive. It's called a divine passive. What that means is that we didn't do this. God did this. God has accomplished these things among us. And what is it that God has accomplished among us? In short, the gospel. In length, what has God accomplished among us? He has sent His Son, who is the perfect man and also the perfect God. God accomplished demonstrating His mercy and His love by sending His Son to be born of a virgin, to be born in poverty, to be raised and to live a sinless life, and then to die on Calvary, to be raised from the dead, and then to be ascended on high. This is what God has accomplished among us. And we sang this song this morning. It's funny, I asked Jeremy if, uh, if he knew the words to come behold the wondrous mystery, because I wanted to sing it this morning. And he said, yeah, in fact, I've already included that song this morning. But were you paying attention to the words Let me read to you the words of what God has accomplished. It says, Come behold the wondrous mystery. In the dawning of the King, He the theme of heaven's praises robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended and took on flesh to ransom us. 
Come behold the wondrous mystery. He, the perfect Son of Man, in His living, in His suffering, never trace nor stain of sin. See the true and better Adam come to save the hell-bound man. Christ, the great and sure fulfillment of the law in Him we stand. Come behold the wondrous mystery. Christ the Lord upon the tree in the stead of ruined sinners hangs the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption. See the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory, grace unmeasured, love untold. Come behold the wondrous mystery. Slain by death, the God of life. But no grave could ever restrain him. Praise the Lord. He's alive. What a foretaste of deliverance. How unwavering our hope. Christ in power resurrected as will we be when He comes. That's what God has accomplished. And it's in a perfect passive. He has done it. And it is finished and the results continue forever. And Luke wants to sit down and write this young man this story about what has been accomplished. And notice the phrase here as well. It's so important that you don't miss this. Among us. He didn't do it under a rock. He didn't do it under a cave. In fact, keep your finger there and go to Luke 24 for just a second. And I want to show you one phrase. After Jesus was raised from the dead, you have the story of on the road to Emmaus. And you've got two men walking alongside the road and Jesus appears to them and they don't recognize, He's kept their eyes blinded, they don't recognize yet who He was. And so as they're walking along, Jesus walks up to him and says, what are y'all talking about? And look in verse, verse 19, uh, verse 18, verse 18. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him and said, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? That's how much among us God did what He did. That's how much among us it was when Jesus died on Calvary. You didn't have to convince anybody in the first century who Jesus was or what He had done. Everyone knew. And so when Jesus says, what are you guys talking about? They say, are you like the only person on the planet that doesn't know what's been going on? What's wrong with you? You live in a rock? That's the context because God accomplished all of this among us. Now notice what Luke bases his narrative on. He says, just as those who were eyewitnesses. Let me talk about this word for just a second. I got called up for jury duty. Week before last, and I was just really praying that I'd get out of that thing because I had to just do that before, and it cost me a whole week of my life. And by the grace of God, when I called, I got out of it. Everybody settled outside. But you know, when you have an eyewitness, it's over. There is no trial, so to speak. It's not very difficult. When you have somebody who's actually seen with their own eyes and gives testimony to what's taking place, Luke says, I've based my narrative partly on eyewitnesses. And this is a huge deal because we have eyewitnesses of everything that's taken place. This is not arguable evidence. This is inarguable evidence. What's in your Bible is absolute truth. And it's true for a great many reasons. Primarily God wrote it. But in other words, it's been confirmed by eyewitnesses who saw these things. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says there were over 500 who saw the resurrected Lord. You don't have a place to argue. You don't have a place to stand in regard to the claims of this book. There's a great many eyewitnesses. In fact, if you want to, and you're not absolutely discouraged about the time, turn to 2 Peter. I want to show you something just a second. Go with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. Not 1 Peter, 2 Peter. Chapter 1. Look at verse 16. 
2 Peter 1.16. Look what Peter says. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were what? Eyewitnesses of His majesty. I don't make anything of this up. And none about this is a myth. This is not a fable. This is not a children's story book. This is based on eyewitnesses. Paul said, I didn't, or Peter said, I didn't write any of this based on a myth. I saw it. And I wrote it down. Turn just a couple of pages to 1 John chapter 1. Look how John begins his letter in 1 John. 1 John 1. That which was from the beginning, notice, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning this word of life. This life was manifest and we've seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we've seen and we proclaim also to you so that you can have fellowship with us in the gospel. Nothing about this is a myth or a fable or made up. And the reason I'm so passionate about you getting this is because you've got to communicate that to your children. Because if they can understand this is based on eyewitness accounts, the trial's over. There's nothing to question. This is true. You can die for what you find in this book. Because it's utterly true. In fact, the next word that we have in this book, in this, I'm sorry, in chapter 2 of Luke 1, is this word ministers of the word. The word ministers actually in the Greek means under roar. Now think with me because I know you've seen the movies of, of slaves and ships in the bottom of the hull and they're chained up and they've got an oar in their hand and they're doing this business right here back and forth driving that ship across the ocean. They were known as under rowers. Out of sight, out of mind, doing the hard labor and forced to do it. Luke says, I've based my account on the under rowers of the Word. They were servants of the Word of God. Now today, pastors and men use the Word to serve them. To make their churches huge and their cars expensive and their houses big. They use the Word of God to be their servant. No, no, no. The Bible uses men as servants of the Word. You and I are supposed to die and to use our life in service to God, His glory, His gospel, His word. We're under rowers. In fact, that's exactly what Paul calls himself in 1 Corinthians 4. Men should regard us in this way as under rowers of Christ. And when I was thinking about this, I couldn't help but think about William Tyndale. You know why you have that book in your lap? A man by the name of William Tyndale. He decided that this book should be written in common English. And so he took it and ran from the Catholics and they chased him and he hid and he went from place to place to place as he translated it into the English language. And when they finally caught him, they tied him to a stake and they threw tar on him and they lit him up and they burned him to death. But he prayed for the king of England as he was dying that he would understand and receive the scriptures. And a couple of years later, that king did come to faith in Christ. That's under roars of the Word. And that's who we are. There's so many men that have died just so you can have that book in your lap. We, so many around here just prize the King James Version. It's an excellent version, but they got 83% of that from William Tyndale who burned to translate it into English. John Wycliffe, he died for his translation work. John Huss or John Huss, he died for translating into the Czech language. All these men died so you and I could read the Bible in our own language. Luke says, I got most of my stuff from them. Ministers and servants of the Word. And then he goes on and he says, I followed all things closely for some time. Me also. I've done this as well. I've been used to. I had my own little shop. I was a physician. Then I met Jesus. 
And then it changed everything for me. And so everywhere we went, the historian, he, you know the only reason you probably have Mary's song is because Luke probably sat down with Mary. He said, tell me about that night. She was alive. He was alive during the same time. The eyewitnesses are also considered primarily the apostles. He went to Jerusalem. You know who he met in Jerusalem? John. He sat down with John. Tell me about it, man. Tell me. Tell me the stories because I'm writing a record. He's very faithful. He's very careful. He's very meticulous in everything that he does. And then he comes down to this last thing and he lays out this word, that, meaning here's the purpose why I've done everything that I've done. You may have certainty concerning the things that you've been taught. Now, I want to talk to you about this last word and I know it's late. But I want to show you this last passage. It's translated very differently. This is your ESV. This is your NASB. No one knows what to do with this. Um, and they don't know what to do with this word right here. Here's your so that. Here's the word no. And he even, again, English majors are going to love this. It's a compound word, meaning really no or personally no. Epignosis. I want you to really know this, Theophilus. He says, about the things or the message that you've been taught. This is where we get our word catechize. catechize. This is our teaching. I want you to really know the message, the message that you have been taught right here. And then they end it with the, and this final word here, as follow. Let me, I'll finish on this word. Just bear with me. This is one of the most significant words to me in the Gospel of Luke so far that I've come across. Swallow, if you think of a swallow, the little bird that aggravates us to death here at this church and builds nests all over the place. If you'll place, replace the W with PH, you've got the word swallow. Swallow means foot slip. means you're going along and you hit a slick spot and you slide out from under you and you fall. It's the word swallow, okay? Now, this is not the word swallow, or it is, but it's got, I marked it up, but it's got the word, or the letter A right in front of it, which is an alpha derivative, which means the opposite of foot slip. Osfollow. So no longer swallow, swallow, it's osfollow. Don't foot slip. I'm giving you a firm place to stand. That's what that word means. I'm giving you a firm place to stand. Here's what the Gospel of Luke, this is what Luke's trying to accomplish. In my mind, Theophilus is a young man. He's heard the Gospel. He's probably received the Gospel, right? And obviously, he's a very important man. He's his most excellent Theophilus. Probably a little bit more than a young man. But he's heard the Gospel. He's responded to the Gospel. Yet he lives in the first century where everybody hates Jesus. He divides everything. And so he's trying to give this guy a firm place to stand so that he can resist the temptation to turn away from Christ when he's persecuted. Let me tell you why I'm passionate about Luke. You better, as a parent, and we're committed to as a church, giving your children a firm place to stand. Because generations before us, they have not been given a firm place to stand. What did Luke do, by the way, to give Theophilus a firm place to stand so his foot wouldn't slip? Wrote a narrative, taught him from the Word of God, taught him who Christ was and His miracles and His teaching. You know what we did? Took him to a youth conference. Took him to a youth rally. Took him to hear some speaker and some rock music and some smoke. It's what we did to give our kids a firm place to stand. And that's why everybody on this stinking mountain tells you that they know Christ, yet they're okay with all sorts of godlessness and unholiness. And this is a really big deal. Because we've been blessed with more kids in this church than I've ever... There's more kids in here right now than there are adults. And I'm committed to giving them a firm place to stand. And the only way that I know how to do that is how Scripture does that. And the way Scripture does that is by teaching them the Word of God. Amen. We've got to provide a firm foundation. Y'all, we went through the season where we had all these crazy babies being born. Now we're in the season where all these 
crazy babies or becoming crazy kids. And you realize we're going to have a season where a large number of these kids are coming to faith in Christ. And we're not going to know what to do. Danny's going to be so busy with the baptistry, just keeping it full of water every week. And the elders and the deacons are going to commit to praying that these kids understand the gospel and connect the dots as we walk through the gospel of Luke. But you've got to do your job. It's not about making a decision for Christ. Luke's going to tell us it's about living and dying for Christ. And that way when they get to school and they're facing all the godlessness that they are right now, all the homosexuality and all the other things, they're not going to waver because they have a firm place to stand. And when they see what all that contemporary Christianity is doing and falling apart, they're not going to waver. They're going to go, I don't know what's wrong with y'all, but I know what the Bible says. That's wrong. I never had that. But I'm committed to giving your kids that, and I'm committed to seeing you that you do the same thing. That's what we're going to do in the Gospel of Luke. Let's pray.